I would like to invite uh, Asanka. And Asanka is the CTO of WC2 with uh, more than 20 years of experience in designing, inventing technology, uh, not, uh, uh, not always at WC2, but uh, for many, many years. I know Asanka already for decades, I think 12 or even 14 years. And I truly value him. It's one of the persons in the world who can leave problems away and, and, and listen to customers and translate that back to uh, a W2 company, to uh, Sanjeeva Veravana, like, hey, we should implement this in our product roadmap. Um, his previous uh, CTO, Paul Fremento, is a close friend. I know Asanka learned a lot from him. And fortunately, Asanka, for many, many years, you are the CTO. So please give him a uh, very warm welcome, uh, Asanka, CTO of WSO2. Thanks, Ruben. Thanks for the warm welcome. Good morning, everybody. So um, I live in uh, California, San Francisco, and uh, it was a long trip for me, but when Ruben invited me, I couldn't say no, uh, because uh, we are business, business partners, but more than that, really good friends, and he's a really a good uh, human being as well. So two great uh, keynotes about innovation, and um, I'm going a little bit deeper into uh, technology and uh, how you can use it uh, when it comes to innovation. So what I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to pick a few technology trends and then explain a little bit about how, as a technology company, so WS2 is a technology company that we provide uh, cloud-native middleware, and how we can help uh, to uh, implement some of these uh, technology trends and how we are going to address these uh, technology trends. So um, I pick four trends. Why I am using uh, a numbering system? Because in general, tech speakers are really boring and they take long. So when I'm using a numbering system, you know exactly where I am. I, I am. And even if I'm boring, then you know how long you have to wait to listen to me. So uh, the first trend is about uh, digital experiences. Uh, so I took example, uh, last no objections, I believe uh, picking Tesla, even you guys might appreciate their innovation. And I'm not challenging this beauty, uh, not about the mechanics about the car, it's about the digital experience. So uh, I have a Model S Plaid, and this is my second Tesla. Uh, so I was driving a Model 3, and I didn't buy something for myself for a long time, so I thought I should buy something. Then my wife said, okay, midlife crisis, uh, it's buy, better buy a new car than getting a new wife, so go ahead. So um, the digital experience with Tesla is amazing. Uh, so because uh, you could just log into the system, and then you configure your car, and you order, and then it allows uh, me to, uh, whether I'm going to take a loan or I'm going to uh, lease it, the financials will be configured automatically, insurance will configure automatically, and then I get the, uh, uh, I put the order. So then it's a custom made one, because Plaid is a custom made, and every day after that, I get a notification about how they are making the car. So cars making, uh, the car was making just next to my uh, place. Uh, it was in Fremont uh, uh, Tesla factory. And I get a notification. And it took about more than a month. And then the car was ready. Then I'm trading my Model 3. I'm getting my Model S. So I got a notification in the uh, uh, Tesla factory. I had to park my Model 3 in a specific location, take a picture, upload it. And then once I do that, my uh, mobile app, it reconfigure from my Model 3 to Model S. And it gave me the location where the Model S was parked. I go there, pick it, no interaction with anybody. I drove back. So that was an amazing digital experience. And I think everybody is expecting that kind of digital experiences in modern world. So we have to provide a personalized geosensitive, 
a more kind of predictive digital experience for our customers, and that's where we are heading to. So this is what uh, our customers are looking for. So that's where WSO2 is helping to build these digital experiences. So this is an onion diagram I drew some time back about how you can build these digital experiences. When it comes to digital experiences, there are three personas that we have to address. One is our customers. <coughs> That's called the B2C. And then one is our partners, basically, uh, because a business cannot survive by themselves. You have to be in that business ecosystem. So you have to do B2B in one side. And then the employees are customers too, right? You need to build applications to uh, uh, facilitate and then make them productive. So B2E is really, really important. So all these personas we have to address, and you have to build this application. So as a, a company, WSO2, we have more than, I think, 40 applications. We connect with more than 80 systems. So when it comes to a larger enterprise, this will be like magnitude of uh, many numbers of these things that I explained. So when it comes to digital experiences, like you have this system of record layers, right? You might use a database. You might use a traditional uh, ERP system, or uh, in the modern world, <coughs> you might use a cloud-based system. Uh, so many systems, so those are called the system of record layers. But system of record layers are not enough to build digital experiences. You need to enhance the capabilities. You need to connect uh, these uh, uh, capabilities when you are building experiences, as uh, um, Ruben explained. You need APIs, you need integrations, you need security to do that. So you wrap these system of record layers with domain services, domain APIs, and enhance that capabilities and create uh, what we call as experience APIs that will interact with applications. So if you can get that done, in Gartner terms, they call it as a modular, sorry, a composable enterprise, and I call it as a modular enterprise. So if you can get that part built, then you can build any application. It can be a web app, it can be a mobile app, it can be a, a connection to a large language model, anything you can do when you get that particular infrastructure done. So this is a very important thing to achieve that. But then again, you can't achieve it overnight. You have to go step by step, but uh, having a vision to get there is really important, and you can time it and get there by step by step, so an iterative and more agile approach will help you to uh, build something like this. The second thing is about uh, composability and modularity. So I think everybody, they like uh, music, so the best example for modularity and uh, composability is orchestra. Because you have different type of uh, uh, players who play different instruments, but end of the day, they are providing one symphony, right, to uh, listen. Uh, so that's about the modularity and uh, composability. Any Metallica fans here? Okay, so I'm a Metallica fan, but more than that, I'm a LinkedIn Park fan. So Metallica did a concert in San Francisco City with San Francisco Symphony. Can you believe like Metallica doing something with uh, um, uh, a symphony like that? But it's really cool. If you go to YouTube, you can find the videos, and I think if you go to iTunes, you can find the music as well. It's an amazing uh, uh, combination a totally different set of uh, kind of genres, but they made it really um, uh, interesting. So like that, inside the enterprise, you get Metallicas and you get uh, uh, these kind of traditional orchestras, because different teams, different cultures, different capabilities, but uh, in a single vision. So you need to have this composability and facilitates this modularity inside the enterprise. To do that, uh, you need to take a lot of actions. So let's look at the modularity. So I think everybody is familiar with this um, concept of microservices. In uh, modern application development, you write app microservices, right? But then again, just writing microservices is not the correct way of doing uh, 
application architecture. As an architect, uh, you have to find a way to combine a set of microservices and create a business API out of it. Because technical APIs are really boring, what you have to do is expose a technical API out of, sorry, expose a business API out of these technical APIs. So that's where like um, these concepts like domain-driven design coming. Uh, you can use domain-driven design to find what are the set of microservices that you can group together and then create this business API out of a set of microservices. It's about this, uh, how you can divide the <coughs> big ball of mud, uh, you might have a lot of capabilities, it can be a monolithic system, so how you can divide this big ball of mud and create these modules is where uh, things like domain-driven design coming. And then uh, from WSO2 point of view, we uh, introduced this, actually I authored it with uh, Paul Fremantle that uh, uh, Ruben mentioned, our founding CTO. So we authored this concept called cell-based architecture, used by many companies, including Uber, uh, Okta, one of our competitors, actually. Uh, it's a very popular architecture style uh, that widely used in the industry, and in our product architecture, we support cell-based architecture to module these, uh, uh, to group these microservices that you identify using domain-driven design in a very architecture Manner. So this is the URL. If you are interested, you can go and read the paper. And then uh, this pattern is about uh, domain driven is uh, pattern is not a, just about grouping microservices. It's about teams as well. And I think you are familiar with these uh, two pizza teams. But uh, with the modern um, engineering practices, what Elon Musk did for Twitter. It's about one pizza team now, like do more with less. Uh, but still, you need a way to group these workloads into and map into the teams so you can use domain-driven design uh, in a um, very efficient way inside your organization. So when it comes to domain-driven design, um, there's this Bible call, uh, a blue book call, um, uh, domain-driven design written by Eric Evans. But don't read that, because it's about object orientation. Even I started reading um, about uh, domain-driven design with that. Uh, it's not exactly what we want in modern architecture. There's another person called uh, Vaughn Venon. If you are interested about learning a domain-driven design, go and read his books. And he's, a, he's one of my good friends. Recently, we did a, a podcast together about how domain-driven design map to cell architecture, and how WSO2 is supporting that particular architecture style as well. Then that's about the modularity, and then composability is really important. So how you do composability, uh, composability first thing is about APIs. So APIs are the uh, business connectors, right? You expose your business capabilities using APIs, and then you let your development teams internally, externally, to uh, access these API, access these business capabilities using APIs, so that's the fundamental thing. But then again, how you discover the APIs and how you advertise your APIs, that's where the marketplace is coming. So WSO2, uh, in the API management, we have a really good marketplace, and in our SaaS product that I'm going to explain <coughs> at the end, called Corio, we have a really good marketplace, and marketplace is an exchange, right? You have the providers, you have the consumers, so you can uh, advertise your APIs, and then if you want, uh, you can have a monetization plan behind that, and let the consumers to come and access that. So there's a small uh, uh, kind of a debate in the market, what's the marketplace and what's the developer portal. From WSO point of view, uh, we have this clear uh, differentiator. Marketplace is the internal um, uh, kind of the registry or the asset store that you share your uh, digital assets. And the developer portal is the external view of that subset of your digital assets that you want to expose to external people goes to the developer portal. So cut down version of the marketplace is where the developer uh, portal. But then again, can be 
debate because uh, different people got a different definition for that. And then uh, the, uh, when it comes to composability, I use this term called pipeline tune. It's very important because uh, everybody should, should get into this uh, enterprise pipeline. Like how the code that you write get delivered and get into the fingertips of your end user is where the pipeline coming. So you, you can't have many pipelines. It has to be a single pipeline that you... Um, write these different modules and let it to, um, I mean, uh, transform it from development to testing, testing to production, and then uh, uh, back and forth. So that's where the pipeline tune you or know, the CICD stuff coming and playing a picture. And then uh, the automated delivery uh, is really important because it has to be automated, otherwise uh, it's really hard to manage the composability, and there are other stuff like the dependency management, version management, all these things are there uh, to have a proper uh, composability in your organization. So from WSO2 point of view, in our products, we support that. We have the semantic versioning, an uh, easy way to create APIs, <clears throat> publish to marketplaces. All these capabilities are provided by uh, our products, and if you want to have a proper, con proper, proper composable system, you can uh, use the products and get the advantage of that. So next trend, uh, number three, is AI. Nothing to explain. I think even Roomba uh, used a lot of examples about AI. Everybody's speaking about it, and if you are not supporting AI, then you are left out in the uh, today's market. So from WSO2, we are uh, approaching AI in two ways. First thing is called the AI augmented software engineering. So that's about how you can use AI to do the software engineering. Basically, how you can increase the productivity of your developers. So I think if you are a, a developer who's writing code, you might have used Copilot, a great tool increase the productivity a lot because it guides you uh, throughout the, uh, your coding practices. So you don't have to go to the documentation. And then uh, some of the language changes that happens uh, quickly will uh, identify by the uh, Copilot engine and let you know. So it's a very uh, uh, good way of writing uh, these uh, uh, different type of uh, programs. And I think uh, you guys might uh, heard about the ballerina language that we introduced some time back. It's a uh, way of writing new integrations. So uh, this question uh, coming time to time when I speak to um, customers and prospects that ballerina is new, how can I get my development team learn about it? So Copilot is a great way that it supports ballerina and then you can quickly write code, even my son, he's 16 years old, and he writes ballerina without any issue because he uses uh, Copilot as well. So you can tell your developers to use uh, uh, Copilot. So that is where the uh, AI augmented software engineering coming. So uh, relation between why I took Copilot as example, it's a VS Code plugin. So WSO2 tooling, uh, we are moving all our tooling into VS Code. So that way, you can use uh, things like Copilot and uh, be in the same IDE when you are doing the development that you don't have to switch in between. In addition to that, we release something called uh, um, uh, Chat API. Uh, basically, you can use the, use the human or the natural language and uh, ask to test your APIs. Because sometimes testing APIs is really hard, and uh, you can uh, you have to generate test data, you have to uh, look at all the uh, uh, kind of uh, different type of functionality that you have in the API, but this tool helping you to test your APIs. And we are going to introduce more stuff uh, when it comes to integrations um, uh, that uh, using human uh, or the natural language that you can tell create this particular integration and it will create uh, the configuration for you. Same thing for APIs. And then there's another thing that uh, industry is looking at to standardize business objects. Based on the domain, 
uh, you standardize what type of business objects you are using inside your API. So uh, we are going to introduce an AI tool that will do a semantic analysis of the existing APIs and things that you are uh, going to um, uh, introduce and look for the common business objects that you can use across all your APIs. So that's another thing that we are going to introduce. So the, those are like a few examples, but we are going to keep on um, introducing uh, tools for this AI augmented uh, uh, software engineering practices. So other side of the story, how you can write AI-based applications. So we can support a lot because, again, the foundation to write these applications are um, APIs. So how you can connect with OpenAI and various other uh, engines like Llama, and how you can create connections, connectors to these third-party uh, uh, APIs and uh, AI engines and generate applications is where we are going to help and we are going to have reference architectures, templates, and uh, uh, accelerators for you to develop these applications. So that's the second um, uh, thing that we are working on to help our customers to build these applications. So uh, that's about AI. So I said 4, but 4.1. Uh, so API first. Because nothing to explain, you have to be API first, and you have to uh, think API first, and you have to design your systems API first. But the technology should support that. Just thinking and having a, a clear mindset and having a, a clear uh, business objective doesn't help uh, if the tool set doesn't support. So that's where WSO2 is helping to generate APIs very easily so uh, you can have this um, creation of APIs. So for me, API is like how you collaborate. I think. Um, English is a really good example for APIs, right? Different people speak in different languages, but uh, English is kind of a common way of communicating. So similarly, APIs um, like that inside an organization as well as outside the organization with your business ecosystem, APIs can use as a common way to communicate because earlier days, if you uh, started your career when uh, service-oriented architecture came into the picture, we used to tell, okay, Peter service, Simon service, like that person who implement the service, we gave the name to that particular service and we asked from that person how you can execute that service. And if he or she is on leave, even sometimes you don't know how to access that particular service, right? So that's where APIs change this uh, uh, issue and um, change it to a totally different way, a common way of accessing business objectives. So nothing much to explain. You guys know like we have the API manager as a product, and then we have uh, something that we brand newly developed called APK, API Platform for Kubernetes, because Kubernetes has become a Linux in networking, because everybody is using Kubernetes these days. So we introduce uh, that product optimized for Kubernetes as a Kubernetes native API management system for you to be API first. And from designing to uh, uh, sharing to consuming uh, API securely supported in the platform. And um, uh, like Ruben mentioned, security is really important because you need to secure these APIs. Why? Because you are exposing these capabilities or the, your business capabilities from the API. So uh, an API management system should support that. And the API lifecycle is really, really, really important because you are totally depending on APIs uh, in your entire application architecture. So uh, having that particular lifecycle for the API is very important because sometimes you might think just having an API gateway is enough. API gateway is part of the story, and API gateways are com becoming a commodity these days. Uh, it's beyond that, how you can do the governance, how you can do the security, how you can handle the uh, monetization, how you can do the observability. All these are part of that. That's where you need to have a proper API management system, and that's where we have built this product to cover all these requirements when it comes to API management. Then the second thing is about, uh, sorry, 4.2 is about cloud native middleware. So for my analogy for middleware, it's a stadium. 
because stadium providing the infrastructure for you, right? So it can be a soccer game in one day, it can be a concert in another day, but uh, it can be a water race on another day. So it provides the infrastructure for somebody to host an event. So middleware is like that as well, though it provides 80% of what you need to build something, and 20% you build on top of that. So that's where middleware is really, really important. And um, in today's world, the traditional middleware doesn't work because it should support cloud nativeness. And I believe uh, middleware is disappearing into code and infrastructure with uh, especially Kubernetes is coming into the picture. So that traditional way of using middleware is not more um, kind of interesting for developers. Like you don't deploy stuff into a server anymore, right? Either you containerize it or you run it as part of your infrastructure level. So that's where cloud native middleware coming. And we had to look at a lot of things inside cloud native middleware. Gateways, message brokers, service measures, uh, observability, all these things are there. And we are providing these core capabilities by uh, leveraging the technology. So uh, one ex I'll take two examples. So um, uh, in our SaaS platforms, we use uh, something called eBPF. Uh, why eBPF? Basically, uh, it's for observability. And if you... Uh, Enable observability, it's affecting the performance, right? Because you are keep on capturing uh, the data from the message flow, so it's affecting. So eBPF is a layer for observability. That you don't capture at layer seven, you capture at layer four. So we introduce that, then it is not affecting the performance. So now you don't have to worry about eBPF because as the technology provider, we have done it. And then the second uh, example is about Cilium. So service meshes are really popular, but it's a pain to run a service mesh in a production environment, and not easy to run a service mesh in a production environment. So Cilium is a really uh, good technology to do that, that you can uh, uh, have a proper service mesh inside your infrastructure. And in our uh, SaaS products, we are using uh, Cilium as an example. So as a technology provider, what you are giving is these kind of uh, futuristic cloud native middleware. Those are a few examples. And we are keep on experimenting and introducing what you require uh, to build these applications on top of uh, cloud native middleware. Then 4.3 is about platform engineering. Very hot topic. So I took this stadium as an analogy for cloud native middleware. And then people who kind of build a stadium are the platform engineers. In North America, actually, uh, the demand is really high. Even uh, platform engineers are getting paid more than software engineers these days. Because it's really hard to find platform engineers that can manage the current infrastructure. As you guys know, running a Kubernetes in, uh, set up in a lab environment, really easy. But running a Kubernetes cluster in production, it's really hard. So one of the organizations I know that um, their CIO got fired and then uh, around 200 development team got affected. Uh, so when we looked at uh, why it happened, because they have um, introduced a Kubernetes cluster as an internal cloud seven years before. After seven years, none of the production workloads are running inside this Kubernetes cluster. A 200-person team was working on that. So it's not easy because um, it's a new technology. And a traditional tech ops person I doubt they can learn and do that, but uh, with the same set of knowledge, it's really hard to manage Kubernetes because it's a totally different world, and then running a secure production-ready Kubernetes cluster is not that easy. So that's why platform engineering is very important these days. Who are the people facilitating this uh, infrastructure level stuff? So in our definition, platform engineering is two things. 
DevOps and SRE. SRE stands for Site Reliability Engineering. So a combination of those two comes as platform engineering. From WSO2 point of view, we support uh, uh, all our products uh, in a very platform engineering friendly manner uh, because we have uh, command line interfaces. We have system APIs for the products. Like when you have a system API, a platform engineer can be really productive and build these uh, uh, different type of uh, CI CD processors and whatever that they want to uh, provide for the application developers to build these applications. 4.4 developer experience, because developers are the um, people who's building digital experiences. End of the day, they have to write a co uh, piece of code and then build these digital experiences. So if the developers are productive, then you can generate these digital experiences quickly as well as in a very um, effective way. So they are uh, uh, developer experience is really important. So I took an analogy like a chef, like who uh, can uh, cook really good dishes. So if he or she uh, has necessary tools, as well as a good environment to uh, do his or her job, he can focus on the, uh, what he cooked rather than worrying about other stuff, right? So how we can be productive. And if he's a left-hander, then how the tool set works. If he's a right-hander, how the tool set works. So that developer experience is really, really important. So we did uh, uh, actually uh, flow efficiency management system sometime back in a uh, garment factory. And then this uh, left-hand, right-hand thing uh, was a learning thing that how you set up the machines and how you uh, uh, have specific machines for uh, these specific people because that way the productivity goes really high. So like that, the developer experience is really important. And developers are very specific, right? They like to use the tools that they uh, like to use, so how you can facilitate that. So the VS Code example that I took earlier is one really good example because developers like VS Code, so if we can provide the tool set on top of that, it's really easy for them. And then have these other stuff, the boring things that they uh, don't like uh, in day-to-day -day basis to do, uh, like uh, data mapping as example, because I'm a, uh, even my title says CTO, I write lot of code and I have one hour blocked in my calendar every day as uh, uh, hour of coding because um, I believe every technical person regardless of their title they should write code otherwise you will lose the touch. So uh, as a developer I hate this data mapping connecting to databases those type of things. If there's a tool to do that and then focus on the interesting things that a developer uh, would like to do it's really important to make them productive, as well as get everything that they need, how they can uh, start a project, how they can um, like, uh, do the development, how can they do the testing, how they can uh, connect to this uh, uh, pipeline, how they can communicate with each other. So all these things are very, very important. So at WSO2, so this is one uh, uh, really focused area that we have. We have a tooling team who's mainly focusing on tooling, and then uh, we get a lot of feedback from developers. I think uh, if you can, uh, if you uh, notice, uh, we have a coding challenge going on these days that the uh, gift is a cyber truck. Uh, why we created that particular coding challenge? Because we can get a lot of feedback from the developers about how uh, the tools can be improved, so really good response at the moment, uh, 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 good uh, registrations, and people are working on that particular code challenge. So this is another area that we are working on. So from 4.1 to 4.4, I explain about API first, cloud native middleware, platform engineering, and developer experience. Those are four uh, top technical trends that we see in the world. So combination of these four, we created a concept called platformless. So a good analogy for platformless, the chef that we uh, took earlier, like if he or she has to focus on 
fixing the stuff in the kitchen, he can't focus on what he is cooking, right? So similarly, inside the organization, if the development team is focusing on building a platform, they can't uh, focus on building applications. You need a platform. That's kind of a norm, like you must have a platform. But is the application team, whether they should focus on uh, building a platform and just uh, keep on maintaining it is a question. So that's where this um, concept of platform, unless we introduce that the application team should focus on the application development, not about the platform. Less. So platform is there, but it's not visible for the application developer. So uh, that's how we introduce this concept called platformless, so that uh, the developer, in this case the chair, can be very productive if, they, if you have a platformless approach. And the platformless uh, concept, uh, it is facilitating two things. One is about the uh, development side, and one is about the uh, runtime of your uh, application architecture. So the uh, People uh, kind of, they don't understand sometimes the gravity or the complexity that you have inside an enterprise. Writing a web app, writing a simple uh, a mobile app is really easy, but doing software engineering inside enterprises is really, really, really complicated because you have this uh, legacy systems, you need to connect with uh, cloud-based applications, you have to collaborate with people. So that's where uh, a concept like platformless helping because now you can look at this problem of enterprise software engineering and facilitate it here. In this example, I have used uh, these uh, marketplaces on collaboration and then these uh, domains and then on the um, right hand side, uh, we see these cells that are uh, running inside the uh, different uh, uh, kind of namespaces. So all these things required when you do this development and uh, concept uh, like platformless is really helping you to have a very rich software engineering process. So we wrote a paper about platformless, uh, like the cell architecture. And uh, myself, uh, our CEO Sanjeeva, and then we invited Paul uh, to contribute to this. So it's in 0.82 version now. Um, why we left it at 0.82? Because uh, to get feedback, and it's released under Creative Commons. So if you are interested, you can read the paper, and you can send a PR or a contact us. We are happy to incorporate it. So we did a bunch of... Uh, uh, updates with uh, some of the industry leaders, and then we gave updates to industry analysts. Uh, we got really good feedback from them about this concept because everybody believes that uh, we should uh, for, uh, wo walk towards this platformless type of concept. Because I'm in the CTO club in the Bay Area, and when we gather uh, like uh, uh, once in two months time, uh, most of these CTOs in this organization, they are speaking about that people are mainly focusing on building platforms, about worrying about Kubernetes, worrying about service measures, and they are not writing applications. So that's where we thought we need to fix this problem in the industry and came up with this concept. So how you can achieve platformless? First thing, you can use commercially available platform. Okay, uh, that's the first approach. That's the easy way of doing that. If you pick the first way of doing it, the entire organization will become platformless because you are not worrying about the platform anymore. Second approach, sometimes the industry or the commercially available platform might not give exactly what you want, then you have to build a platform. Perfectly fine, but uh, you have to understand the effort that you have to put, you have to understand um, the skill set you required, and most importantly, platform is not a project. It's a product. Because you had to keep on improving it, you had to um, uh, like uh, look at what's really happening in the technical domain, what's really happening in the business domain, and then facilitate all these changes into the platform. So you have to treat it as a product, not as a 
project. So if you can understand that, as well as uh, identify these four um, capabilities, API first, cloud native middleware, uh, developer experience, and platform engineering, then you can build a platform. So as an organization, how we are helping it? For the buyers, we have a platform called Corio uh, that we call as the internal developer platform, providing that platformless experience. Just go, sign up, and you will get an account. You can build your um, applications inside Corio. So it's a complete uh, internal developer platform providing all these four capabilities, and you get that platformless experience. So you just have to add developers worrying about anything. But if you decide you are planning to build an application, what we are doing and helping, providing the core technologies in API management, integration, and identity and access management, you can utilize as the foundation pieces and build your applications. And these things can run on-prem on or cloud, or we provide these individual capabilities as SaaS offerings as well. So this is our approach, and then we believe everybody should uh, focus on that. And most of these things that I explained, we are going to demonstrate our, at our WSO2Con. It's happening on uh, May 7th to 9th in uh, Miami, and uh, registrations are still open, and I'm inviting every one of you to uh, come and join us there and see uh, these capabilities uh, live uh, in the demos and the technical sessions that we are doing. So I think that's it. I think this is directly connecting to the innovation. And if you can uh, implement or uh, get into platformless, you can be more innovative without worrying about the underneath technical stuff, uh, but focus on the business side of your um, uh, digital innovation. Thank you. Asanka, thank you so much for uh flying over all the way from the Netherlands. I know it's a 10-hour flight, so thank you so much. Are there any questions? This is your moment. Yeah, Asanka is here, the CTO of WS2. Is there any question from the audience? Yep. Steve. Uh, I heard WS2 APK, that's the name of the management. Yeah. Uh, the management layer is not there yet. I understood. Sorry? The management layer. The management ah, OK. Layer yeah. So, uh, uh, so APK architecture, it has a control plane and a data plane. So what we did with 1.0 release the data plane uh, because um, um, Kubernetes created a new paradigm for application developers. So Kubernetes developers, they like uh, command line interfaces and then use the APIs. So that's well enough for a Kubernetes native developer. So because of that, what we did to address them, we released the uh, first version only having the CLI and the uh, system API, so they can be productive. But now we are working on getting the uh, control plane. So the control plane um, is a common control plane for the Kubernetes uh, product or the APK product, as well as our API manager the traditional API manager. So you can use the same control plane, create your APIs, and either deploy it to APK or either deploy it to API manager. And because um, control plane shouldn't require this uh, dynamic scaling and resiliency and run it as a uh, cluster inside the Kubernetes. Right? It's more kind of a, a Kubernetes service thing. So. That's where, exactly. So it's running uh, like that. And we are releasing it before our conference, and it will be available. So we can handle the Kubernetes native uh, developers as well as who need some management stuff in a UI. They can use the uh, uh, control plane that we are introducing. So uh, even the data plane is production ready now, and a bunch of customers using it. And uh, uh, especially in North America, there's a big demand because everybody moved into Kubernetes, right? Uh, so uh, even current version, it's uh, uh, 
production ready, and we have uh, tested it, but uh, it's a relatively new product, uh, so there can be uh, issues, but we haven't uh, kind of identified any major issue, um, and uh, that's why we are quickly releasing the next version with the complete control plane, as well as improved uh, uh, runtime for APK, and then things like GraphQL, gRPC, um, and uh, uh, async APIs, all these other stuff other than REST APIs coming with the next version as well, so you will get the full capabilities okay, in the thanks. future. Yeah. So, Asanka, um, a token of uh, our appreciation, a small yeah. present from the Netherlands, so thank you so much, and hopefully in the coming years we have a lot of contact as friends yeah. and uh, technology much. nerds. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you, everybody. <clears throat>